that off there before we start. Good afternoon. This afternoon is a photo safari. I started leading these safaris to Africa when I taught at Berkeley. Africa is a very unique place. North Africa is a Muslim stronghold of Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, and Egypt. But then after their sand dunes fade, there is a great stretch of the Sahara Desert, and then there is Sub-Saharan Africa, and that's where we're going in this photo. And you're looking today at a zebra, a ubiquitous animal in South and Central Africa. Next. Antelopes predominate as a meat source. While we were there in our campsites, we often dined on smaller antelopes that we had shot on our daytime or afternoon safaris. Next. As you can see, some of them grow quite large and they become trophies for great white hunters like Ernest Hemingway and others that you have read about or seen of in the photos that I've shown you in other programs we've done. Next. Bird life is also ubiquitous throughout Africa and the birds are really very beautiful. There is one area in Africa in Kenya where the bird life is so phenomenal that in one group of maybe a million flamingos, a whole lake turns pink. And when they take off in flight, it's a huge pink cloud that goes off into the sky. Next. These are things that would frighten you to death they're not United Airlines. They're little sky puddle, and they jump from one area where you can lodge to another because it's much too far to drive across the grounds of the landscape. So this is the plane you take from one place to the other with around six passengers and a pilot. The pilot looks to be around 18 years old. Next. That's the landscape with animals that you see across Sub-Saharan Africa. These um, antelopes, when trophy size, are considered collector's items. It's unfortunate to note that the men's club, or faculty club as you might want to call it at Berkeley, had as a faculty in the 30s, a group of faculty that liked to shoot animals. And so the walls of the men's faculty club were loaded down with these heads. Hence, the younger members of the faculty refused to eat there. Next. You can see across the distance, the introduced bird the ostrich. Next. Those are our little game going carts. You go out on one game drive in the morning, you come back and have lunch and you go to an afternoon game drive. 
and then you close in on your campsite before it's dark. You don't want to be out when it's dark, believe me. In this part of Africa, there are you, two very poisonous snakes, the black mamba and the spitting, um, oh, what is it called? I'll think of it in a moment. Next. Next. These are people who obviously were with me on the trip. This is a Cal Berkeley trip to Africa, a two week trip that I led. Next. 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 Americans love to take hot balloon trips across the landscape, and this was one of them that we took. Next. There's two of our ostriches parading for us. Next. Next. And there is a mother zebra and her baby. Next. Here we are at lunch between game drives. Sometimes we did not go back to the park itself, but we brought the lunch with us and it was set up by the team and then allowed us to go on with the drive the moment the lunch was over. Next. There's a phenomenon that happens in Africa. It happens even in Piedmont Gardens. That is, it rains occasionally. And here where it's raining, it fills up a very shallow area called a pan, P-A-N. And then animals come from all directions to be able to soak themselves or in cases where they're thirsty to just drink and drink and drink. Next. There are our vehicles for the game drive again. You can see that they are open to the environment, allowing danger to approach. We had several approaches by lions and sometimes by rather fierce elephants that, we, that were quite unhappy with us being in their way. Next. This is a small stop on a game drive. Next. That's the lodge at one of the places where we stayed. Next. Excuse me. I can't hear you. It is an oasis that we're looking at. No, it's not an oasis. Next. This is one of the more elegant lodges we stayed at. You can see what we look like. We were a mixed group. And part of it was rather sad. Half of the group was made up of Poofs. That's people who went to Yale which is known as the Berkeley of the East. You can see me in the back there on the left in my blue and gold shirt. Now, one of the sad things about this time in our history was that Ronald Reagan was president of the United States. And I have nothing against the former cowboy Western movie star, but he had a passion to support the apartheid government of South Africa. And as you know, that government does not exist any longer, but it made for a very, very difficult time of us, the Americans, supporting a regime that was deeply despised by the majority of South Africans. And joining us in causing more trouble than we were worth were the Israelis. The Israelis were desperate to test fire the 
mechanism for setting off their nuclear bomb. If you know anything about modern Israel, you know that it's a very narrow country stretched out along the Mediterranean and there's no place to set up a nuclear weapon, set off the trigger mechanism. So unfortunately, during the apartheid years in South Africa, they were given the right to rule over all of German former South Africa, which is mainly Namibia. And so one dark and stormy night, the American CIA, which constantly keeps satellites in the air over the entire world, saw the flash that told them that the apartheid government had sold for a lot of money the rights for the Israeli to test in the Negev, excuse me, not in the Negev, but in the deserts of Namibia, and they had tested a nuclear weapon. Next. You're looking out of the airplane the wrong way, so we'll go next. You can see some of the landscape was very rugged, very difficult to transport. There is a famous train in South Africa called the Blue Train. It's very much like the other famous trains in Europe, like the French TGV. This is not a picture of a train. Next. This is the sky over Southern Africa. Next. Here we are again with our 18 year old pilots and a series of airplanes that take us again from one lodge site to another. The airstrips are very short, very much unpaved, and also very difficult because you often get a zebra or another antelope group that wants to sit down on the airstrip and you're forced to sort of wait till they get tired and move on. Next. There we are in, again, locked in and safe, going off on a game drive. Next. You can see these areas of swamp-like areas, particularly in Botswana. Botswana is one of the largest nations in Southern Africa. It's uh, very famous because it has many, 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 many more animals than it has humans. So it's a great place to see animals. It also is the basis for a great river system. There are many great rivers in Africa, many of them leading to great falls like Victoria Falls. Next. Again, a very large part of the Zambezi River, which flows through South Africa, oh, excuse me, Botswana. Next, again, a area in Botswana. Next, and again, an area in Botswana. Next, and a small member of the antelope community. They are very good at hiding in the tall grasses, etc., because they're considered delicacy by the large carnivores. Next. Again, no place where tourists go is long unfound by people who entertain tourists. And so at uh, one of our game rest spots, we were entertained by these members of the local community who obviously come and entertain you and then are paid by the group leader like myself. Next. These are a group that are known as jackass penguins. The, there's rumor here, although we're not supposed to let it be known, 
that Renata and Robert brought two penguins back with them from their recent trip. And if you listen quietly at night, you can hear them up there on the top floor. Next. Again, one of those ships that come out to pick up your larger ship. We were on a 120-person ocean-going ship when we went into the areas of Africa and along the African coast. Next. The migratory habits of whales are well known to the African people. And they come out many times to hunt the whale. Next. The Cape of Good Hope. The most southwestern point of the African continent. Next. And there is a jackass again, better known as a penguin. They are very free and open. They come right up to you, have no fear of humans. And they love to be fed small fish. Next. That is Tabletop Mountain in Cape Town. Cape Town is one of the wonderful settlements along the African coast. It was a point of great trouble in the years of trouble. Cape Town was settled by the Dutch. The Dutch lost the Cape in the Boer War. But the Boers stayed on. If you are Boer, it means you come from Dutch origins. And in many cases, many famous people made their early reputation in the famous war that the British had with the Dutch Boers. And the Boers ended up winning in the long run because they took over the British government in South Africa. And the British government knew not what to do with them, so they made it place a homeland for the Boers under English rule. And the Boers are the people, much to their disgrace, that gave us apartheid, a system in which white supremacy ruled the whole of the Cape. Next. There we are again at sea. We're trying to make part of the journey on our sea legs. And of course, you can't go to sea according to the American Mila Maritime Commission unless you, of course, have safety drills. And you drill over and over again to make sure that you at least can get that damn vest on before the ship sinks. Next. These people seem to have had a couple of drinks in the bar before they came out for their drink, for their safety drill. Next. That penguin again. Next. These are some of the old buildings in Cape Town that give you a feeling for what was a very wealthy place. When, in fact, Many European Jews had to flee. They came to South Africa. South Africa, whether you know it or not, is the center for diamond. And it and Namibia have found the greatest, biggest, and largest stones ever cut. And these Israeli became jewelers and diamond cutters and polishers. They and also the Indians that were sent by the British to South Africa. And when all this fell apart, the diamond business split in half 
and much of diamonds today are cut and polished in Israel, and the others are cut and polished in India. In fact, there is a huge Indian community still living in South Africa, but a large number of them went also like the Jews did back to Israel, the Indians went back to India. And if you know nothing at all, you can go and watch a wonderful movie called Gandhi. For Gandhi grew up as a young man before he became Mahatma Gandhi in the nation of Southern Africa. And it shows you this very much so in the brilliant film that was made of his life. Next. This again gives you that feeling that you could easily be in Holland. The love of the South African for flowers and for their own architecture shows through in Cape Town itself. Next. Now, one of the things that has become quite famous in South Africa is the wine industry. And they have great vineyards spread across the landscape. And wine does very well there. And in fact, a large amount of the wine from South Africa is exported. And you can find it in shops here in California in competition with various American and French wines. There you can see the list for one of them, the Cabernet Sauvignon. Next. Uh, the good looking guy on the far right in the blue and gold is me. And looking back, we're looking at Cape Town from the ocean side. There's Tabletop Mountain. You can take a vernacular to the top gives you a breathtaking view of the vineyards of Cape Town itself and the nearby areas. Next. Again, a shot of one of my passengers and tabletop. Next. Uh, that's inside the bar area on the, uh, on the ship, obviously. Thank you. Next. And that's looking at Cape Town again off to the left and tabletop off to the right. Next. This is part of that vehicular I told you about that would take you to the top of tabletop if you want to look down upon the scenery. Next. This again is a scope of the sea as it comes into South Africa. Next. This South African climate is very mild. It's very much like California. So there's a great deal of flower and flowers that grow wild. This is getting very near the top of tabletop where you can see the lighthouse. Next. This is looking down at the sea from near the very, very tippy top of tabletop. Next, there's the ubiquitous band reading us and we got to the areas near where we were going to go on another one of our excursions. Next. The person in the middle is one of the crew members. And I think the other two are also members of the crew there to the dining staff. Next. Everywhere you go, a penguin here and a penguin there. Next. You see them down on the beach. They're not afraid of humans but they don't like you to mess with them. So if you get too close, they'll snap at you. And if you get really close, they'll attack you. Next. This is one of the people selling us goods along the seashore. Next. 
I don't know why I took this picture, but I did. Next. There is our crew from our ship. There is our ship in the background. You can see it's rather large, took around 120 passengers plus a crew of 20 or 30 more. Cal Berkeley does these tours continuously through something called Cal Travel. And in my time at Cal, I led around 100 of these to places to include across the Silk Road, Australia, New Zealand, India and Pakistan, Egypt, the European continent from Austria through Germany to France, Next slide. There is someone saying goodbye to us. Usually these trips take two weeks. Needless to say, they're not cheap. Next slide. More entertainment, near enough to the ship so that we could all take part in it. Next slide. This gives you a view of how haughty and strong will the early European settlers were who came to Africa. That's one of their sailing ships, a model of it, placed in the harbor at Cape Town. You can see that they're set up for music, but there is a grand piano with its cover on down to the bottom left. Next. Now you're going through part of the Okavanga Delta again. This delta is very dangerous because not only do they have spitting cobras, and black mambas as poisonous snakes, snakes. They have the deadly Nile crocodile, which has a tendency to submerge and come up when you least expect it. If you want to see that in action again, soon we will be showing you in the film committee the famous film with our heart. <clears throat> with Humphrey Bogart and Catherine Hepburn, African Queen. Next slide. We're going on a land walk. Again, very dangerous to do because you don't know what you're gonna meet around the corner, which might be a rather angry bull elephant. Next slide, please. This is an overexposed view of the seashore. Next slide. You can see the nature of the rock formations while you see the little people, which are us, and the grass growing near this rather large escarpment. Next slide. Again, you see off the far left the crashing sea. Then you see the uh, serious rock formation. Next slide. People resting. These were easy to think about, but difficult to do when you actually started the climb itself. And we didn't want anyone to get sunstroke from dehydration. So we also had to cart with us the water. Next slide. Some very enthusiastic passengers traveling with me. Next slide. Again, you can see the difficulties of the climb. Next slide. You can see the cracks within the walls and the ability to scoot around them. Next slide. Now you can finally get a sense of the break and the sea itself. This is, um, these are very dangerous waters. They're known to be the fishing areas of the great white shark. 
and the great white sharks come down here, sometimes can see them. They actually leave the water itself as they snap in two, a huge, uh, oh, it's a seabird that also congregates in these waters. Next slide. And there we are. I don't see myself. I must have taken this. Next slide. Now we're coming down again where you can see people living. You can see that it's natural for the South Africans who are very proud of their nation. You know, of course, that they have a great leader in Mandela. Unfortunately, like many African countries, they have been spoiled by their lack of leadership. So the man who followed Mandela, President Zuma, is now serving a jail term. It's unfortunate that many of the people, both in French and English Africa, who came to power when the French and the British empires disappeared, had actually no experience in a democratic process and quickly became dictatorships. This was particularly true for a while in South Africa. There is a wonderful man who grew up in Rhodesia. He's a novelist. And you might have read some of his many wonderful books about the first woman detective agency in Africa. And he was a white man, again from Rhodesia. He left Rhodesia when Rhodesia became a, dic a black dictatorship, crossed into South Africa, didn't like it either and continued his way on to Botswana. And Botswana had just gained its independence from both Britain and South Africa. So he stayed there and wrote his famous novels, although he, as a settler in Rhodesia, was a Scottish man who had, was, born in Rhodesia, was born in Scotland. And in the years past, he had finally given up on Africa and gone back to live in Scotland, in Edinburgh. And now he writes wonderful novels about the first woman detective of Edinburgh. So he won't give up on detect detectives or women. He just gave up, unfortunately, on Africa. Next slide. Here we are on that area of Cape Town, where the colonial Dutch ship that was used by the Dutch when they first came to the Cape of Good Hope. I hope that you know that it was the Dutch who made all these uh, trips. It was the Dutch who sailed on to India, not the British, but the Dutch. And it was the Dutch who then went on to make a huge and very wealthy colony out of something that you call Indonesia or Java for its main island. Next slide. Again, in the wine country, we're taking a walk along one of the paths that go from one vineyard to the next. Next. I don't know why I took this picture. It's a picture of a bridge. Next slide. There we are walking along a path again. Again, we haven't run across any bull elephants yet. It's either on this series of slides or my next series, which is my next lecture, that you will run across enraged bull elephants. Next slide. A part of the river. I don't think you can see crocodiles on this part of the river. Next slide. There we look down at the sea again, the beach. One of the great things about the beaches of South Africa, they're really wonderful. And 
while there are dangers there, like great white sharks, there are also dangers in Southern California. And that doesn't keep people away from the water. Next slide. I'm not sure what she's trying to tell us, but whatever it is, we'll go on to the next slide. I think we're getting ready to wine taste. Next slide. I don't know what that is. He seems to be inspecting shells. Yeah, they could be oysters. Next slide. Well, if you're interested in cement blocks, there's a lot of cement blocks in South Africa. Next slide. Now, I'm afraid this leads us to Robin Island. Next slide. You can see his arms. Robin Island was a dreadful island. It's off the coast of South Africa, and it's where many of the great leaders of South Africa, particularly Mandela, spent many years in his life there in incarcerated. Next slide. This is a group entertaining us again in a playground area. And a cafe is located in the area. Next slide. Next slide. Many of these places that you see like this while they're smiling children were actually townships set up for the blacks where the blacks were forced to live in the years of our apartheid so that the nicer housing was reserved, of course, for the whites. Next slide. Next slide. Here we are near the beach, taking a break. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. There is one of my enthusiastic passengers making friends with a local African boy. The African of the countries we traveled in, Botswana, all the way up to Kenya, were always friendly, always welcoming. Maybe you don't know about Africa. Africa is so big that you can take three United States and put it inside of Africa and have more room left over. It's an amazing continent, the dark continent. Great rivers like the Nile, the Congo, the Yangbezi dominate the landscape along with wonderful, wonderful people, crops and animals. Next slide. They have very modern systems. You must not think of Africa as a totally backward, unmodern country. They have built great spans to bridge the gaps so that they may have roadways that connect from one side to the other. Next slide. There he is at last. King, the largest animal in Africa is the elephant. The largest 
mountain in Africa is Kilimanjaro. And between the two of them, they dominate. These African elephants have been hunted for years by the strangest view of what the elephant's tusk is good for. Now, obviously, some people like to carve the elephant tusk because of its ivory. In other cases, in other cases, in India in particular, the tusk is ground and thought of as an aphrodisiac. So in many cases in the wild, there's been an elephant that has been drugged and lost its tusk, and then it goes and has a very difficult time because the tusks are actually used for defense. The skin is very, very rough on the elephant, and it often goes to those pans I was telling you about, those watering holes, and then goes in, in for a complete dip and sprays itself in the muddy waters because the muddy waters gives them a kind of protective coat because their skin is very sensitive to being damaged by the sun. The difference in this elephant and the one that you know, if you know elephants at all, uh, the Indian elephant is the ears. The ears on the African elephant are much, much larger than those on the Indian elephant. And somehow, the African elephant never t was tamed. You simply cannot tame and take home with you a big bull elephant. They just don't tame. Whereas the Indian elephants have been tamed to lift logs and woods and forests and to do other manual labor. And this is not true for the African elephant at all. In some parts of Africa where the elephant, particularly in former Rhodesia, now Namibia, the elephants have been protected. And then you come to another problem. The elephants in Namibia have to occasionally be culled. That means they have to be shot because there's too many of them and they are over uh, dining on the nearby forests and woodlands, which will then destroy all of the natural coverings. So you have a series of tragedies from the size of this great beast. And by the way, they are a great animal. Uh, they work as family groups in Africa. When you hear the thud, thud, thud of a coming large female, it means she's leading a group, particularly of young elephants, elephants that only come up to the bottom of her tummy there, and she leads them across every road path. They just don't allow the small elephants to go walking wild but the senior females are in charge. And believe me, you don't want to mess with them. If you saw those little small vehicles we traveled on our game drives on, she could crush that game drive vehicle. So that it turned out to be a tin can. Next slide. And there they are, a very large female and smaller elephants following in her wake. Next slide. And there we are again with one of the antelope family. Next slide. And there we are with more. You see them coming down to the pan. The one, the little one at the bottom is drinking. The ones at the top are watching over and the ones in the middle are waiting their turn to be part of this festive moment near the water hole. Next slide. These are these 
unusually wild people known as Yaleys. Yale is known as the Berkeley of the East, and they were very friendly people to travel with. Uh, I don't think they'd ever seen a really beautiful, incredibly glamorous woman before. But on the ship, one afternoon late, I showed a film. And since I was going to lecture on diamonds as one of the great stones that were harvested in Africa, I showed clips from Marilyn Monroe's wonderful movie, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, where she sings Diamonds of a Girl's Best Friend. And I thought the Yaleys were gonna drop or jump overboard. They were so excited. There they are in their best Yale outfits. Next. And two more Yaleys on the loose. Next. And there we are in one of our game lodges. You can see that uh, South Africans also like beer a lot. Next slide. Again, you always have that ubiquitous local dancing group that will show you either what the Zulus once looked like and how fierce they were or whatever is necessary to gain the tourist dollar. Next slide. Next slide. And there is a large group. You see one male looking back at us and the rest going down to the water's edge. Water is, of course, a staff of life for the elephant. They need it to cool their bodies, to keep their temperatures low, and they also drink gallons and gallons and gallons of the H2O. Next slide. And there we have us slowly but slowly following a female and a young, young baby elephant. Next slide. And there we are on a game drive again. You see what I mean about how fragile the sides of the game vehicle is. A big, strong bull elephant could crush that thing in a matter of minutes. And also an attack by a fiercely unhappy lioness could also do a great deal of damage. Next slide. Next slide. Now, here is somebody that initially you would like to think is a rhino, but it's not. It's a warthog, which is also very much a creature of the water holes. Next slide. And there is a gigantic bull elephant who is not at all happy. As you can see, our vehicle is right in front of him. And this is always those dangerous moments. I can remember coming back to Chobe National Park, and we were late getting back from our game drive, and it was dark suddenly. And we ran around. We came around a corner. We were in a forested area, and there in front of us was an enraged bull elephant who was very unhappy to see us, and with our headlights on. So we quickly killed the headlights and sat steady and still until he made enough noise to let us know he was perturbed. And then he went around us. But he did bother to take and whack us once with his trunk and his body. And the whole vehicle shook. And you could have seen what damage he could have done, except he wasn't bothering to bother with us. Next slide. There you have one of the famous ostriches. Next slide. 
there's a ship, very modern. There's the people on sh shore preparing to again give us entertainment. The answer as to whether we paid them was yes, either I or the people in charge of the company paid them for coming down to the ship to say farewell. Next slide. And there you see that while we're leaving, the elephant stays on, trying to live with all the problems that come from people wanting their tusk for either carving, by the way, that is now illegal to do, and nevertheless, there's still a trade in elephant tusk, and people wanting it not just for purposes of carving, but for purposes of using it as a powdered form of an aphrodisiac, which is absolutely stupid. Next slide. And there is a quite a number of, some are feeding on these, and you can imagine how difficult it is to eat this kind of prickly grass that you see growing there. And others going into the nearby lake Excuse me, for the water supply. Next slide. And there is one lone male off to his own, a symbol of Africa for all time. Next slide. And I wanted to show Daniel this one because he's so proud of his turtle. Here's one of those big monstrous land turtles you kind of run into in Africa. Next slide. There we are on a larger game drive, moving from one park to the other. We didn't always take an airplane. Sometimes you could drive from park to park. Next slide. And here we are. Oh. Here, the most dangerous animal perhaps in all of Africa, not the elephant, not the warthog. They are dangerous, but what's really dangerous is up in the middle. That is a Cape water buffalo. And more people have died from Cape water buffaloes or from hippopotami than they have from lions or elephants. Next slide, please. Oh, oh, there he is, hungry as he is. Look at what he's eating. It's just, and they're full of spike needles, and yet they have the kind of double stomach that can digest these things. And so they, they can rip a forest apart, and that's one of the problems of too many elephants and too small a forest land. Because as Africa becomes more and more populated, the land is used up by farmers who set all kinds of traps to try and drive the elephants away from the farmland. Next slide. This is another game preserve that we're going into. Next slide. on a game watch. Sometimes you have to sit for hours waiting to hear these people who run these businesses and drive these trucks all have radios. And when they see something, they report it in to the other trucks. And then in no time you have around five trucks looking at the same two lions. Next slide. There is danger itself. You see that hard head, that solid bone. And it's very difficult to kill these animals. And they get you in their sight. And they have very good sight. And they run you down. Next slide. Here we are, resting our way around. Next slide. 
here is, while well, very ugly, very dangerous, the warthog. You see this, they're small on him. Usually they're quite large and they're tusk. And they're very good at opening up a, a person's stomach if this animal is charging you. Next slide. And here is the ubiquitous giraffe, who, by the way, can be quite dangerous too. What he does if attacked is use that very long shaft of a neck and throws it in a way that'll break your back if it hits you. Next slide. And there she is, the baby zebra with her mother. Maybe we could get a black and white coat for Geraldine's baby when she comes into this world. Next slide. And there we are getting out of our game drive for the day. Next slide. And there we are being welcomed by a native grants group. Some of my friends at Berkeley don't like these kinds of slides because they think of it as mass tourism exploiting the locals. So we have our own arguments about those things, but it's very true of Berkeley. They are gonna argue about the sunrise and sunset at Berkeley. Next slide. Again, he's entertaining us. Next slide. And they are entertaining us. And next slide. And, and they do this, you know, they come on board the ship because it makes it easier on everybody. You can go down to your stateroom if you don't want this. You can sit in the bar or you can sit out on the deck and watch. Next slide. Now, at a time like this, it always looks, oh, I don't know what, like tourism that it is. But in its day, these great native nations, like the Zulus, put forward huge armies. And when they were unhappy, they made it well known by attacking and murdering all the local whites. So you should be careful how you mytholog mythologize these people and what they did. They had very, they've been very badly treated by the white man. And Mandela is a great hope of the future of other African leaders. Next slide. It's one of my shipmates trying to show us that she can do the local dances. Next slide. Again, we're on the ship and we're watching a show. Next slide. And there is somebody who should know better uh, trying to outdance one of the local dancers. Next slide. And there are two of the younger members of my group trying to join with a native group. Next slide. And we're back on safari again. Next slide. And we're on a either morning game drive or an afternoon game drive. You have two a day. You leave around nine o'clock in the morning and you go on all the way till almost noon. Then you end that game drive and you either go back to the campsite, the lodge, or you eat on a bench that has been brought out by the natives. And then you start the afternoon game drive. Next slide. Now you can see what a warthog can do when it wallows in the mud. This is heaven for the warthog. 
not so much heaven for you. Next slide. There are some of my compatriots. Next slide. It is. All right. Well, we're going to come back the next time and do another one that's even better. Uh, the next safari I took, I took a film crew with me, and they made that into a film. See you then. Thank you for watching. What's that? The elevation of Table Mountain.